Well, good evening. Welcome to another Sunday night devotional from here at Salem Creek Church of Christ. Thank you for tuning in and sharing your time with me tonight. And I hope that these few minutes we spend together will be a great conclusion to your day and that we will uh, be benefited by this time we've spent looking at the Word of God. Tonight, we're going to be in the 10th chapter of the book of Exodus. The plagues are just about finished. There are only two that remain, and those are the plagues of darkness and death. So uh, get comfortable in your favorite chair, get your Bible out and open to that place. And in just a moment, we're going to get into our study While you were doing that, uh, let me say this. If there's any way that we can assist you, give us a call here at Salem Creek. Our telephone number is area code 615-893-7532. And if you have the opportunity, uh, next Sunday morning, join us here for worship. We meet twice every Sunday. We meet at 8 o'clock. We meet at 10 o'clock. We have two services in order to facilitate social distancing, and we do request that you wear a mask when you come, but we would love to have you come and worship God here with us at Salem Creek. Well, as we go through the book of Exodus, we are in the process of seeing God uh, taking his people out of their bondage in Egypt, and he's been uh, bringing plagues upon the Egyptians. Now we reach the point where there are only two plagues that remain, the plagues of darkness and death, The previous two plagues, that is the plague of hail that was sent on the land, and then the plague of locusts, have just thoroughly devastated Egypt. Go back to uh, Exodus chapter 12, and let's, or rather chapter 10, and look. let's look at verses 12 through 15. Uh, The Bible says that the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt uh, for the locusts, that they may come up on the land of Egypt and eat every plant of the land, even all that the hail has left. And you can imagine how devastating hail would be to their crops. Uh, God says, we're going to finish things off here. You, you stretch out your hands so that the locusts can come up that will eat every plant, everything that's been left by the hail. So Moses stretched out his hand, his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord directed an east wind over all the land that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled in all the territory of Egypt. They were very numerous. There have never been so many locusts, nor would there be so many again. Listen to verse 15 and the description of the destruction that they brought. For they covered the surface of the whole land so that the land was darkened. They ate every plant of the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Thus, nothing green was left on tree or plant of the field through all the land of Egypt. God, with that plague, had finished thoroughly devastating the crops of the Egyptians. And of course, they depended upon all of that for their food. There's that description there of the locusts and the devastation that they brought God was making a very important point here. You remember when Moses went to Pharaoh and says, thus says the Lord, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, I do not know the Lord that I should let Israel go. And he was very arrogant and said, I am not going to let you go. Who is the Lord? In Exodus chapter 10, verse 2, God said, I'm doing these things so that he will know that I am the Lord. He will know that I am the Lord. When you read through the book of Exodus, it's interesting to look for certain ideas that appear from time to time, and and they appear quite often. There are several. One of them is this idea of knowing the Lord, the theme of knowing the Lord is found throughout the book of Exodus. For the Israelites, knowing the Lord implied that they were in covenant relationship with him and walked in submission to his will, to his commandments. That's uh, pointed out in Exodus 31, verse 13, where the Bible says, you shall surely observe my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You, you keep my Sabbaths 
so that you can know that I am the Lord. Douglas Stewart, in a very wonderful commentary on the book of Exodus, says that know the Lord is shorthand in the Old Testament language for understand that I am the one true God and that those who are faithful to me who keep covenant with me, uh, I, I'm the Lord for that person. And I'm faithful to those who keep covenant with me. And I'm the judge of those who do not. Two things pointed out there in his uh, explanation of what know the Lord means. It's shorthand for this idea that I'm the one true God who is faithful to those who walk in obedience to me. And I'm the judge of those who do not. And so that's really what of what God is doing here. He, he's bringing judgments upon Pharaoh, upon Egypt, so that they can know that he is the Lord. Now, they're knowing him here by experiencing his judgments. In uh, chapter 10, verses 21 through 29, we read about the ninth plague that come, came upon the land of Egypt. But I'd like for us to just uh, open our Bibles to that passage and read together. The Bible says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which may be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. Notice there, that while the Egyptians had to deal with the plague, God's people were spared. It didn't affect them. Verse 24, then we pick up and read this. Then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go serve the Lord, only let your flocks and your herds be detained. Even your little ones may go with you. But Moses said, You must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice them to the Lord our God. Therefore, our livestock too shall go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, but we shall take some of them to serve the Lord. And until we arrive there, we ourselves do not know with what we will serve the Lord. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. Pharaoh said to him, get away from me. Beware. Do not see my face again, for in the day that you see my face, you will die. Those words would frighten most people. They didn't frighten Moses. And he answered Pharaoh simply by saying, you're right. I shall never see your face again. And of course, he didn't. So let's talk about this plague of darkness. Uh, God sent darkness over the land of Egypt, according to verses 21 and 22, for the space of three days. And listen to the description of that darkness. It was so dark that no one could see anyone. The Bible says, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. That's understandable. If you imagine a darkness that is so thick that nobody could see anybody else. I remember uh, at least on a couple of occasions, I have taken a tour through a cave. We get deep into that cave and, and the guide would say, okay, stand very still. I'm going to turn out the lights. He'd turn out the lights and you would have a darkness that was so thick. If you put your hand right in front of your face, you wouldn't be able to see it. Because of that thick darkness, a darkness that could be felt, the Bible says that no one rose from their faith, from his place <clears throat> for three days. Why did God send darkness upon the Egyptians? <clears throat> to ancient people, darkness was something that was very ominous. They were afraid of it. <clears throat> Later on in the prophets, God would use that in a, in a symbolic way to talk about what was going to happen to his people. They were used, darkness was used symbolically in a place like Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 10 or Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 16 where the prophet said, Give glory to the Lord your God before he brings darkness and before your feet stumble on the dusky mountains and while you're hoping for the light. Repent, give glory to God before he brings darkness 
And if he does, that darkness is going to cause you to stumble. He used darkness there in a symbolic way. Ancient people shut the gates of their cities when night came. Go to the second chapter of the book of Joshua in verse 57, where the two spies who were sent out by Joshua uh, met the woman named Rahab, and uh, they were talking there about the night coming and the gates of the city being shut. And so ancient people were terrified by darkness, very ominous to them. They shut the gates of their city at nighttime. Uh, and, and that's, you know, again, throughout the scripture. So he's going to bring this plague upon, of darkness upon the Egyptians, and it certainly to them would be a very frightening thing. Think about Psalm 91 and verse 5, where the psalmist says of the one who trusts in the Lord, you will not be afraid of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day. Think about the terror that comes at night. Ancient people would very often be terrified by darkness. Up to this point, and especially with the previous two plagues, the Egyptians have been, been thoroughly devastated. Their crops have been ruined and, and their agriculture has been destroyed. And, and light is something that is absolutely necessary in order for plants to grow. How far into three days of total darkness did these Egyptians go before they began to think, you know, the natural order of things has been completely overturned and a basic fact of life on the planet has been removed. What's necessary for life to thrive? What's left necessary for life to exist? You have to have food, you have to have water, and you have to have light. He's turned the Nile River and other sources of water into blood. He's laid his hand on that. He's destroyed their crops with the hailstorm, with the locusts. The third thing that is necessary for life to exist is the presence of light. That's a fact of life. Now he brings darkness on the land for three days. How far into that three days of darkness did most Egyptians get until they realized that the God of Israel, the Lord God of Israel, meant business, and that he had completely laid his hands on everything that was necessary for life. Think about the plague itself and how oppressive that was. It's described in verse 22 as thick darkness. It's described as a darkness that can be felt. Now, that's hard to imagine darkness so thick that you could t stick out your hand and, and feel that darkness. Uh, some people say that it's possible to translate that statement this way, a darkness that requires one to grope around. That certainly makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? If you are in total darkness and you're trying to walk around in the room, you're going to stick your hands out to, to feel what's in front of you, grope around in that way. And then in verses 20 through 24 through 29, you see Pharaoh's response there, and he seems for a moment to relent. Okay, go into the wilderness and serve your God. You can even take your little ones with you, but the livestock has to remain here. He made their going into the wilderness to worship God conditional. They couldn't take their livestock. Moses insisted on taking the animals with them in verse 25. We're going to offer sacrifice to God. And how are we going to do that if we do not have our livestock? And you come to verses 27 through 29. And, and, and you see how thoroughly hardened Pharaoh's heart is. The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, again, we've talked about that expression two or three times, and I understand a lot of people have a problem with that statement. How could a God of mercy and grace harden anyone else, anyone's heart? Remember, this is not a case of God coming along and finding a person who is totally innocent and hardening that person's heart. Pharaoh, by the way, was involved in the process of hardening his own heart. This is expressed three different ways as you read through these plagues. Sometimes we're told that the Lord hardened his heart. Sometimes we're simply told that his heart was hardened. On other occasions, we're told that Pharaoh himself hardened his heart. 
He was a wicked man. He was very much complicit in the hardening of his own heart. He refused to let God's people go. He was not willing to let them go here. And Pharaoh said to Moses, get away from me. Beware, do not see my face again. From the day that you see my face, you're going to die. He's essentially saying to Moses, don't bother me again. I'm tired of this. And his arrogance here at this point reaches its peak. Moses' words really ought to have frightened Pharaoh in verse 29 where he said, you're right. You're not going to see me again. Pharaoh said, don't come back. If you do, you die. Moses answered that by saying, you're right. I'll never see your face again. And he didn't. And the 10th plague concluded these 10 plagues by bringing the death of the firstborn upon the Egyptians. And Pharaoh never saw Moses' face again after Exodus chapter 10 and verse 29. And so things are really very quickly coming to a head there with this plague of darkness. I want us to spend just a moment here reflecting upon this for our own benefit. In one sense, darkness is something that ought to frighten all of us. Now, if I go outside at night, I'm typically not afraid. There's street lights on the street in which I live. I may have uh, the outside floodlight on at my house, but even if I don't, a lot of nights, there's still light that is provided by the stars by the moon that reflects the light of the sun. So I'm not out there in total darkness. If it were total darkness where I couldn't even see my hand in front of my face, that of course might be a very frightening experience. But in a spiritual sense, darkness is something that ought to frighten every one of us. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, we're reminded that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. We're also reminded that if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice truth. Walking in darkness, there is uh, an illustration of walking in sin, walking separated from God. Jesus himself says in the third chapter of the Gospel of John at verse 19, this is the judgment that light has come into the world And men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. And so you think about darkness, you think about light. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. Jesus says men love darkness because their deeds were evil. I'm reminded of something Isaiah the prophet said in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, the moral confusion that existed in his day, and moral confusion exists in our day as well. The prophet said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And it goes on in verses 21 and 22 to say, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes in drinking wine and valiant men in mixing strong drink. Woe to those who are confused about what's right and wrong. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to those who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. Well, darkness in the Bible is associated with evil. Light is associated with God. And we need to be sure that we're not confused about that. First John, or rather the gospel of John chapter one and verse four is talking about Jesus when it says in him was life and the life was the light of men. In John chapter eight and verse 12, Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Later on in second Corinthians chapter four and verse six, Paul writes for God who said, light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our heart, who who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. If you think about all of those passages together, here's what they teach. There's a difference between good and evil. Evil is represented by darkness. Good is represented by light. And by the way, God is light. 
There is no darkness at all in him. If you say you have fellowship with God and walk in darkness, you lie and do not the truth. Jesus said, people love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. They will have the light of life. And God has caused that light to shine in us through the glory of Jesus Christ is revealed in his gospel. And so today, there's a difference between darkness and light. We have a choice. We can choose to walk in darkness. If we do, we're going to stumble around. We're going to fall. And ultimately, we're going to be destroyed. Or we can choose to walk in light. Whoever follows me, Jesus said, will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life. So as we close tonight, think about Egypt. Think about the plague of darkness. For three days, that land lived in total physical darkness. They did so, by the way, because it was a land that was living in total spiritual darkness, led by a ruler who refused to acknowledge the Lord God. In a physical way, they're made to experience the full effects of total darkness. That physical darkness they experienced was an illustration of the spiritual darkness that prevailed in that land, and that darkness was a prelude of what was to come. I wonder today how many are walking in total spiritual darkness, a darkness that is so oppressive that it can be felt by those who are left to grope around trying to find their own way. Don't walk in darkness. Come to Jesus Christ. He's the light of the world. And if you follow him, you're not going to be walking in darkness. You'll have the light of life. And if we can assist you in coming to know him, let us hear from you. Give us a call. Area code 615-893-7532. Well, our time is up for this evening. Let's close with prayer. Father, we give you thanks for the awesome lessons we have seen from this event that happened such a long time ago, which illustrates to us the difference between the light of life, which we find in your Son, Jesus Christ, and the darkness of sin. Help us to walk in the light. We pray for all of those who are not yet walking in it, that they will come to the light, that they will come to know you, the one true God. We pray in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much for tuning in this evening, and I pray that God will richly bless you all.